Mr. Rosenthal holds a bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering technologies and an MBA in finance. He spent the last two decades of his career in various engineering and business development roles, and he is a very multidisciplinary product innovator with a track record of successfully bringing new products to market. General Genomics, Inc. is a bioinformatics artificial intelligence platform that provides customers with a comprehensive analysis of disease susceptibility and treatment effectiveness. He and his partner, Warren Geek, <laughs> said, he says he is a big, big time geek, uh, believe ownership of one's medical data is extremely important and will have a major impact on personalized and preventative healthcare going forward. Please help me welcome Mr. H.A. Rosenthal. Hello, students. So who understood what a artificial intelligence bioinformatics corporation that does predictive analysis on disease based on susceptibility and survivability un actually understands what that means? Anybody, come on, hands up. Front row, oh, we don't have a front row today. Hello, friends, nobody. How about you guys? Anybody? Take a guess. Okay, take a guess, anybody. Ooh, we got a volunteer. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so imagine we are all 99% the same, give or take. Did you guys know that? 10 fingers, 10 toes, two eyes and a nose. Pretty close? What makes us different? What makes us unique? Anybody? Okay, I'm gonna start walking around. You got a fancy shirt on, go ahead, tell me. What makes us unique? Um, our personality. Okay, that's one, definitely, that's a great, hey, 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 you're a winner. What else? What else makes you, okay, you got one, what do you got? DNA. DNA, awesome, so our genetics. What else? How about the food we eat? How about the environment in which we're raised? If I was raised on the beach and say, you were raised you know, in the mountains somewhere, did you breathe a different type of air than I did? Yeah, less oxygen, right? Okay, I, so I need four people for my panel. I need four volunteers. Ooh, ooh, whoever's first is first. Come on, let's go. I got one, I got two, I got three. Get up here, I got four. All right. All right. So, panel, what will we call ourselves today? Why me? Come on, name us. The awesome student panel. Okay. <laughs> what are you gonna call? What are you gonna call us? The catfish. How about tomorrow's? No. no. <laughs> the justice team. How, how about tomorrow's <laughs> leaders today? Is that what you guys are gonna be? Yeah. Okay. Well, how are you guys gonna solve the? How are you guys gonna solve the problems right now of the current medical situation that we're in? We don't know, Omicron just happened. Delta was from before with COVID. How are we gonna fix those problems? Come on guys, you guys know math. Oh, oh, I got it. Hey, I'm going away from the panel. All right, we're going up there. What do you got, what do you got? Modeling. Mod exactly right. Predict predictive modeling is how we're gonna get there. So. Um, you guys have an intro to engineering class, right? Right? What do you guys get taught every day? You got a, a, what, a three minute conversation that you guys have, a presentation about what's new in technology? What do you guys see that's the same and what do you guys see that's unique every day in the current space that we're in? Is it mostly software? Is it mostly genes? Is it editing? Where are we going? Pass it around. Where are we going? I feel like we're moving more towards like the genetic editing, like, I guess. Side of okay. What do you think? I think we're going towards. I think we're going towards genetic enhancement and it's like making ourselves more uh, invincible to the outside world. Okay. What else we got? Yes, I believe so too. <laughs> hey! I do not know. <laughs> Oh, okay. I don't think we're in that. You don't think we're in that? Uh, no. Okay, so you guys, so we have two that think we are and two that think we aren't. In that, okay. So right now, what is the difference between us genomically that you guys know about? Uh, I'm pretty sure that we all have like DNA that separates us completely differently that makes sure that each of us are completely unique. Okay. So that like none of us are, like all of us are completely different regardless of which time period that you're from. Okay. 
for the most part, I did know that 99% of all of us were uh, had were genetically the same. So most of our differences have to come down to 1% of DNA. Okay. <laughs> what what makes us different? What makes us different? So we remember we talked about personality over there. What else makes us different? Like the number of ACE2 receptors that we have on our body. How about the, the genetic composition of our, our muscles? The water that we intake, our height. What makes each one of us unique? I, I'd be disappointed Dr. Richards if I didn't answer this because he's brought up so many times in biochem. Uh, like even like the smallest amino acid change in like our chain can result in being a completely different person. You know, like the amount of melanin you produce can change the color of your skin. The amount of water you drink. Can okay, so life. so with that in mind, why don't we take an approach that goes down to that small infinitesimal level to start a, little little solutions get us big problems solved. How do we do that? How, how are you guys gonna do that? I'm gonna just talk to y'all. How are we gonna do that? There, there's nobody out there trying to do this right now, is there? Do you guys feel like we have a unified approach to medicine to make it better for us in every generation afterwards? Anybody wanna put their hands up and say, yes, that we're going the right direction? Oh, I got no hands. Okay, let's start working on this one. Equation, problem solving, tell me. How do we do it? Um, like, in, at least in our biochemistry class, I wanted to think we do is, uh, like, lab simulations and analyzing how we're able to change the gene to correct the sequence or, you know, make the sequence, like, wrong. Okay, do you use a computer to do that? Yes. What if we had these things called supercomputers? Could we do it faster? Yeah. Any, anybody in agreement? Supercomputers are going to help us get there? Yeah. All, right. All right. All right, who's next? What else do you think? What else could we do? Share information better, maybe? Yeah, you can collaborate with other people, like find one way or like incorporate multiple ideas in like one, one situation. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. No, no collaborate. No collaboration. That's great. Um, what, what, what was the thing that you said? Share resources. Well, share resources. That's one, but definitely using supercomputers to get to get there. I, I think a. Uh, quantitative way to help is to collect more data. Oh, now you're going the right direction. <laughs> yeah. All right, come Collecting on. Collecting more data always, always helps. That's awesome. What do you got? Uh, yeah. Kind of more about what we were talking before is that I think, I think one of our like previous presenters may have talked about like using code to kind of uh, not not like collect data, but predict data to kind of figure out to, to, to kind of get more data on an exponential level in order to make better predictions. Yes. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. So I am a nuclear engineer. I worked in the oil field. I'm a product of the Navy, right? Navy teaches us a lot about um, how to fix problems when there's no solutions. So when you're on a, a ship, like an aircraft carrier like I was on, and stuff would break down, there was no fire department to call. There was no maintenance department to call. You couldn't pull into Midas and get your tires changed. You had to figure it out yourself. And one of the things that frustrated me with what was going on with modern medicine is you see solutions that come from companies that have a key. Every key doesn't work for everyone. So, I mean, case in point right now, how many people in the audience right now think current vaccines that we have are going to work for this new variant that we're presented with? One, two, three, four, five, okay. 10%, give or take, you guys think? Okay, so the ones that don't, can you guys tell me why? We, why are we not, why aren't you confident that we're there currently? Go ahead. And for the uh, new, and the vaccines don't cr produce the uh, correct antibodies to fight the uh, genetically different viruses. That's awesome, okay. So if we were to say that, say we're fighting this virus right now that's going to ever evolve and mutate and change, like the flu and a lot of the other things that, we're, that we deal with, and we don't use the supercomputers that we have, where we have a positive indication, right? Or a positive correlation to what a person's body actually does to it. How do we know in, in our future that you know what we're putting in our bodies right now will work over time or won't give us consequences? So back to, back to the algorithms, back to those prediction models. Right now, and I, it, it's, it's hard to say, but right now we're using a 200 plus year old method. It's kind of a point and shoot or trial and error. A lot of medicine is yes, no, maybe so. They use decision trees, right? 
And on the yes and no, it works, it doesn't work. Do you guys know what the third outcome is on, on normal, like when you get a medication? Do you guys remember what it's called? It's this really long list that lawyers make, side effects. Right, right, okay. So when we think about medicine, what happened to me when I actually saw what was going on with COVID is I have a, I have a seven year old just turned eight and he came to me and he said, hey daddy, am I gonna die from coronavirus? And hey daddy, will I ever be able to see my friends again? And I'm, I was so excited to be able to come in here and talk to you guys live and in person instead of on Zoom. Cause Zoom, it's just not us. I mean, we're, we're a social species. We need to be around each other. That's where we innovate, that's where we create. And what I told him was, I said, you know, his name's Benjamin. I said, Benji, daddy's really effing smart and daddy will figure it out. So I called one of my really good friends named Warren Geek. Warren was um, one of the heads of AI for General Electric. And not AI like you guys think of today, where it's, you know, Google, you know, hey, I'm, I'm typing in some name and this is what it's going to, you know, predict. I'm talking AI where it's, hey, an, air, an airplane's gonna fly from, say, New York to California, it's gonna generate a terabyte's worth of data, and that data's gonna give us analysis on, on predicted failure. Turbine's gonna fail, this blade in this air is jiggling too much, it's gonna break. So what I did was I called Warren up and I said, hey Warren, what if we actually took a lot of our algorithms and, and black box equations that we used in the oil field and in, um, <clears throat> in the industrial space when it came to aviation and then some of the healthcare models and we applied them to the human body. He calls me back and he goes, AJ, somebody's done that before, somebody must have. What's funny is some of the best innovation and inventions comes from the simplest ideas. And what we did was we started writing these patents where we said, hey, if we created a new system, and uh, here, let me get another quick question. How many of you guys are gonna be engineers when you guys go to college? All right, a, a, fair, a fair bit. How many of you are gonna be doctors? How many of you are gonna be data scientists? Yeah, yeah, okay. What if we could start blending those three together? Okay. Watch, watch this, just watch this. Okay, here's, here's one for you. When, when you go to the doctor, do you, do, do you always go to the doctor when you're super healthy? Or do you normally go to the doctor or to the emergency room when you're sick or hurt? Sick, right? Okay. Why can't we use supercomputers to actually start predicting when we'll start having issues? So like, and I'll, half our audience is female. So and, 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 and based on a lunar, um, where the, the moon is and based on a person's um, genetic code, we'll have cycling of, of a female's body, right? For a reproduction of our species. Male have similar, similar things that happen over the course of their lives based on their ability to perform it at a, at a uh, like peak performance in, in ath athletics. Like, you know, hey, you're 18 years old, this is your peak performing, or maybe you're 30 and you, you've taken a lot of drugs and you've gotten really big and strong, <laughs> right? No, but that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what people do, okay? So, and I'm, I'm sorry, I kind of got let down a tangent here. Engineers, data scientists, and doctors right now don't really talk to one another. And bioinformatics is kind of blending all of those together. So when Warren and I wrote these patents and we said, hey, what if we just started making segments? And I made one segment where it's like, I taught everybody with a universal electronic medical record what they would be subject to or subjected to over the course of their life. And then I taught a doctor, hey, genetically, you know, these four people have four different types of disease and I don't need to treat them like they're a, a universal key. Each one of them is different. That's the side effects problem, right? And then I said, okay, wait, so engineer, doctor, well, data science. Well, if I take data science and I said, well, analytically, if I start breaking these, these, these problems down and I put them into tables, and from tables I start coming up with patterns and those patterns start giving me correlations. So correlations I'm able to get better and better data from. At some point in time, do you think we could teach the engineers, and I, I, I love the idea of a biological engineer, right? Somebody who can actually say, this person is going to have this type of issue over the course of their life. Let's, let's give them this much medicine with the help of the doctor to get them to the next next stage in their life. I mean, we're all on a bell curve. You know, we get, we're born at zero. And normally in North America, we pass away as a male, 68, maybe 70, female, 72. So you know you have 70 years to live or die. So if you think about it that way, and we started using the tools that we have, supercomputers, with a couple disciplines in different STEM, which is what you guys are doing, could we make our species last longer? And could we live a better life? What do you guys think? Okay, well, how do you guys start doing that today? And that was when I went to OCAST to actually come and talk and I talked to Secretary Pollard, the head of um, science and innovation, got one of those looks like, oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, let's go, go talk to OSSM. 
I've gone to OU, I've gone to OSU, and, and, I, and I've talked to them, and they're like, wow, how are we gonna do this? And in my mind, I'm like, you know what, I just gotta go the generation that's younger. You guys don't know the world without the internet, right? I, I do, I remember what it was like. Most of you guys, I mean, was it a TI-84 or a TI-92 that you guys had up on the wall? 84? <laughs> but, okay, I, I had those when, when I was in high school, so anyhow. But when, when you think about those things, the tools that you guys have currently today with the, where you guys are going, as a, um, as a school, you have the opportunity right now to start partnering up with those people, those other, other um, majors and create businesses. Okay, so right now, remember the question I asked you, who's gonna do it, right? Who's gonna change the world? Who's gonna make what I'm talking about right now with predictive algorithms be able to get us to the next phase of human life where we can last longer than 72 years old? Maximum right now is like 130 is where they think we can actually peak out at. How do we get people further down the line? How do we make ourselves live longer? What's three of you in the room, or maybe it's six of you in the room that start talking to one another and say, hey, look, I'm going to this school, you're going to that school, study with this professor, study with that professor. When you're done, let's get a business person involved with us and let's create a company and let's make it better. Let's go back to Oklahoma. Is that where you guys are all going to back to? Or are you guys going to go to like San Francisco or New York? Where are y'all going to? Let me ask. Hold on. I'll hit pause for a second. I, I kept talking. Where are you going to go when you're done with school? Depends on where I get in. <laughs> oh, LA. LA. Wherever I'll take me. LA sounds pretty cool, I'm not gonna lie. Holy moly. All right, I'll take the microphone back. Does anybody want to come back to Oklahoma? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right, so let's settle on Austin. Is that fair? Okay, we'll settle on Austin. That's pretty close. It's a couple hours away. Still close to your families that are here? Okay, so if you guys started thinking about, like the way I thought about it, where I pulled up a, a guy who was, you know, former head of AI, and I came up with a company idea for him, and we started working on these problems. And if you guys started thinking about it now, and I'm gonna give you guys a couple business cards, and you guys start saying, hey, you know what, in the future, I think I'm gonna have this idea. Maybe it's amino acids from your, from your professor. Maybe you'll come up with something. Or, or maybe it'll be an allele pair that will change the world that, you know, we have a, we have a thought. We don't know yet, but we have a thought. We have a thought that we might be able to see EQ and IQ in people. What if we could do that now, right? What if we could actually advance our species because we were smart enough to start understanding that? What if we could understand why certain people have, you know, not just gluten intolerances, but how we can make it easier for them to digest certain types of food with, with precision nutrition and precision medicine at the same time? What if we could do that? One of you in here should invent that. Your professors aren't gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you right now, one of you guys should do that. You should call me and say, I did it. And I'll be like, awesome, let's go get funding. Let's figure it out. Like that's, that's the way you guys should be approaching life right now. I don't know, is anybody doing that? Does anybody got a company set up yet? LLC, you guys even know how to set up a company? Okay, how much time we got? We got 10 minutes. Um, all right, here, let, me, let, me, let me pause for one second. What's your major gonna be when you go to college? Uh, somewhere surrounding chemistry. What kind of chemistry? Inorganic or organic? Probably organic. Why? <laughs> uh, it's, it's just a pretty enjoyable course, and carbon seems pretty cool. Okay, we're a carbon-based life form? Yeah. Okay, oh, hold on, hold on, I'm not done. <laughs> so if we go to Mars, and we don't have the same amount of carbon there, how do we continue our life for our, for our species? If, if we go to Mars? Yeah, or when we go to Mars. When we go to Mars, oh man. Uh, Will your chemistry be relevant that you like carbon now when we go to Mars? Well, I think when we go to Mars, will we not uh, still use carbon even when, when we're there? I think like we still require carbon regardless of where we go. So we should build like synthetic lungs so we can breathe the atmosphere of the plant we go to? Possibly. Excellent. Okay, let's move it down. Next one. Next one. My major may be physics. Why? I do find physics interesting. I find it much more intuitive than chemistry. Theoretical? <laughs> Theoretical physics? Uh, I'm not at that stage. No, no, okay, okay. But I, I, I think I would be interested in it. Because for chemistry, um, the atoms are so small, it's very difficult to imagine. With physics, it's like you drop a ball, a ball rolls off a cliff. <laughs> I, I understand this, and I understand <laughs> Cause and effect, cause and effect. Cause, hey, it's cause and effect, guys, it's cause and effect. Okay, perfect, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. Yes. 
We'll come back to you. Go ahead. What are you going to do? No, no, what are you going to do? I'm going to do neuroscience and maybe religious studies. Ooh, ooh, that's cool. Well, what are you going to figure out in the neuroscience field? What do you want to do? Uh, yeah, yeah, why? I want to do brain surgery on little babies. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Can I ask why? I've seen a uh, family friend who, I think their daughter was two days old when she had brain surgery, to remove a tumor, and it completely fell apart in their hands and they took it out and they don't know why. And so maybe I can figure it out. That's a passion project. That's awesome. That's awesome, guys. That's awesome. Um, I personally want to study neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, my grandfather served in the military for 30 years and was unable to serve after he suffered Parkinson's and Parkinson's. So I want to also, like, I want to go into computational neuroscience. So it's like applied mathematics to neuroscience based on cognitive behaviors and like what you can predict. It's also it's about modeling. It's like how you can predict, like, based on this person's like education and their upbringing and what they learned as a kid, like, what neural, neurological diseases they may have as like, an adult. So do you think if, if you went down that path right now, and I don't know if you guys know this or not, but they're starting to census the brain now, where they're actually looking at brain cells to figure out where they actually sit in the brain. Do you think with math model or, or pre predictive analysis or, and modeling, do you think what we have today, the way we approach medicine, with you being in the field, could you change it? And what would be that step change that you would get us to? I don't know, I can change it by myself, but I mean, I think like with enough people, you can do anything. I, I heard you got like 100 plus of the smartest people in one state. <laughs> Is that right? Is that right? Okay, so you guys ever heard the term many hands make less work? Okay, let's, let's go back. I got another question. So the, the baby um, that, came, that came out, the, who was the surgeon that actually did the surgery? I don't know, they didn't tell. They didn't tell you? But why, why did that speak to you? What was it about it? You have the beginning of a life and you have the chance to like help them live it. So you want to give them the opportunity? Yes. That's so awesome. All right, back, back to physics. Physics, okay. I wish I could see your face right now. <laughs> I just, I get this grimace. Oh, okay, all right, all right. Um, with, your, with, your, with your physics, um, do you think there's something that you've seen here in school that with the right professors, the right toolage, you could take a step change in physics using supercomputers or using some of these other type of modeling techniques that we're talking about today? Yes. Okay. What do you think would be the most valuable to society? And I'll, can, I'm going to put one out there. Okay. It, it, it's 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 power to weight ratio. If if I remember right, for batteries, right? So lithium is what we're we're using right now, right? When it comes to cars, did you know that at Stanford, I want to say it was like seven years ago, there was a student, it might be six years ago, that actually took aluminum cans and started recycling aluminum cans and made an aluminum ion battery that had a recharge capacity in like a couple minutes. Do you think you could start thinking in a way to, to advance society to where it's like, hey, look, I know cause and effect, and I understand you know, energy in, energy out. Do you think you could take some of the, the information you have here with some of your other peers and students who might be working in some of these modeling and say, hey, look, hey, I got this idea from this professor. Do you think you can take you know, the AI engine that you built, the data science guys I saw back there? Um, or maybe maybe um, some of the engineers that are coming up with new matrices using uh, graphene. Do you think you could start thinking in that way now, directionally? Because you guys don't get industrial experience currently, right? You guys don't go into industry anywhere, so you guys never see it. You never you never feel it. All you guys see, all you guys see is just the what's on the board. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> You're an awesome answer. This is awesome. Give me, give me, give me something else. Give me some, give me something that you, you've got rolling around in that head right now that's out of left field that you think you know that nobody else knows. Well, before I said, um, I said that I also possibly wanted to be a data scientist, and now I said that I'm, I'm switching over to physics. The reason why I started off with data science is because I find it interesting and my answer before on why we need to collect more data is because um, you can never quite precisely know data enough to 
model or predict the future. The further down the future you try to predict, the less accurate it becomes. And that is why you need to constantly and constantly update the data. And this is something that I think um, an MIT professor named Dr. Le Lebans, who discovered chaos theory, um, figured this out. Or you can never know the initial conditions of something enough, or you can accurately predict um, something way down in the future. And that's like something like what? Uh, the weather forecast seven days from now is not really all and accurate, especially in Oklahoma. It's hard, yeah, especially in Oklahoma. Yeah, but yes, um, uh, and that was why um, data scientists, uh, science interests me, and I have uh, somewhat of an interest in physics. That's awesome. What do you got? Uh, I also said data science to begin with, but actually going on off of a previous thing, I think you said that you'd have to like for sure go to Mars. Well, I was kind of thinking about that in the short time that we had just now. And I was thinking about the reason that we have to go to Mars is probably because of the amount of global warming that's probably occurring on Ooh, Earth. You went the right and way. I was thinking that the reason that that's occurring is probably due to possibly the destruction of the ozone and our use of carbon di dioxide. So an another reason why I want to go into or organic chemistry and use data science is to work with renewables. That is and, so awesome. And actually my brother is currently actually like researching renewables and working with uh, new startup companies to, you know, find re new renewable energy to kind of figure out how it's all working. And just his stories on how, how, how it works have kind of like inspired me to, you know, uh, kind of go about it myself. And actually in class right now, in chemistry, we are learning about the ozone layer and how uh, the use of freons on Earth are currently destroying it and how we need to find new ways to kind of fix that. That's, so a, that's, that's awesome. That's, that's yeah. All right. All right, clap it up, guys, clap it up. All right, victim, I mean, volunteer, volunteer. Um, so who else in the audience today has an idea that nobody's heard before that's sitting in your head that you think, oh, we got a pointer. Oh, oh, awesome, 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 awesome. I'm coming over here. Give me an idea, Mr. Yosemite, of something that you know that nobody else knows. Well, um, currently I'm doing research at OMRF um, in a gene and disease research lab. And we are studying planarians, which are small worms, and we're studying the regenerative properties in these worms. And so humans cannot regenerate um, intestinal cells. And so if you have to have a piece of intestine removed, you, it's scar tissue. Um, and so we are researching about extracellular vesicles and how those can actually be transferred um, from neoblasts or like pluripotent stem cells yep. and be used to create cells that regenerate, hopefully to allow humans to, in the future, um, reduce scar tissues and be able to regenerate some of our uh, tissues. Are you using any data modeling for that right now? Um, we do use a little bit of data modeling. Um, I'm not too much into the computer side of it. Um, do you got any friends around here that could help you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sweet. So, um, speaking of, thank you for just sharing, by the way. Speaking of OMRF, um, I'll t I got a couple minutes left. Just tell you guys something real quick. So, m myself and Warren approached OMRF couple months ago, they gave us a data set of almost 27,000 people, and we're looking for one of the hardest things to find. It's an autoimmune disease called lupus. Do you guys know what it is? We can actually find it now down to the allele. Did you know that? We pinned AWS's supercomputers to actually do this. We're going to have papers that come out here shortly. It's extremely challenging. It took Warren weeks, lots of phone calls, and a few four-letter words that he yelled at me. But I was okay. I was a big boy. You know, no big deal. But you know, it was one of those ones like you know, OMRF gave gave us an opportunity. They gave us a goalpost, and they said, "See if we can kick the ball through the goalpost." And we were able to do it. And I think you know, just taking new approaches to life this way, like with what we're talking about, where you guys, each one of you, has a goal, right? Remember where you're going. I, when I started this business about two years ago, I knew I just wanted to make it better than I found it. I knew if I used the information that I had in my head, wrote a bunch of patents, came up with systems. I only have to come up with the architecture on the outside and just frame the building. There's so many of you folks out there right now that can come in and build individual systems to make it better and make it better and make it better. If you want the world to be better, do it yourselves because nobody else is gonna do it except for you. 
I'm super excited to see where each one of you guys go. I'm going to leave some business cards for you all. I know we're getting kind of short on time, right? We've got five minutes left. One, ten. ten. Oh, we got a couple more minutes left. Great. Oh, before I end then, who else has something outside of yours over there, Mr. Yosemite, that nobody else knows about? Something super cool. Come on, guys. Come on. Anybody? Like a cheat code for like Super Mario Brothers? You know, left, right, left, right, up, down, up. Okay, no, I saw. Anything? Panel? Oh, you got one. We got one. So uh, I think that's like a part of computational neuroscientists. I was thinking that we can use nanizing technology to perform surgery uh, inside the brain just because it's so delicate and fragile. Um, like with any important organ, it's so hard to be able to so precise and you know, cutting a nerve can result in prosthesis or even death at some point. So if you re reduce mortality rates, it would make surgery a lot easier. It would always make it like more automatic even for like, surgeons to be able to just put an to target a specific thing. Like, nerve ending or a specific area in the brain to like work on and therefore like reduce the risk of like injury or damage. How do you think we actually get them in there with the blood brain barrier? Do you actually think we come in in or do you think we come in through the skull? I think we come through the skull. Okay, interesting. Let me ask you guys why on that one. And that's a good ninja move up there, I saw it. <laughs> you come through the skull, you have to do the blood brain barrier. <laughs> that was awesome. Anyhow, um, one of the things that I learned uh, as we've been talking with a lot of doctors is the doctors have a perception of what they've been taught over years. And remember, a, a doctor treats, treats your body mechanically, right? They, they, they go through a decision tree and they say, you know, left, right, up, down, this is, and I'm not trying to get back to the cheat codes, but that's where they, they go through and they say, hey, if I, if I treat the person with, with this type of issue and I give them this type of drug, this is the outcome I'm looking for. The nanite piece, Man, I, I saw a tech the other guys. Have you guys heard about the new pill? So instead of doing a colonoscopy, you actually take a pill. The pill has a camera built into it, and you get different slices throughout the. And, okay, so one of the things that we're working on right now, um, and I'll tell you guys real quick because I got a couple minutes. We have a group that we're working with that are taking 2D images, rendering 3D images with different types of density, density of the skin, density of the actual cells, density of the bones, and we're taking these 2D images that were very challenging to actually see. Uh, good productive um, treatments from, or maybe they had to take so many shots to get it, and we got extremely complex, uh, um, detailed pictures. Where, like, one of the ones they they showed us the other day was a CT scan uh, for teeth, and they could actually see where a blood clot was forming in the brain, because they were looking for the teeth, right, which was much denser. But one of the byproducts of the actual scan was actually the brain matter. So. There's, there's a lot of byproducts of, so nan nanotech that you're talking about, there's a lot of byproducts of the stuff that you guys are gonna see every day in your academic career and then to your industrial career that can be applied into different areas. And I just wanna encourage you. Remember, the direction you choose today doesn't always have to be the exact same direction. Back, who's chaos theory? You, you were, okay. Remember chaos theory, right? So what you think you're going to be today might not be what you, what you actually end up being. Like I, I started off as a nuclear engineer and now I own a company that does bioinformatics with artificial intelligence. And I think, remember, your experiences will define who you are. Your education just gives you that foundation to move it forward. And I just want to give each of you guys, you know, like as much kudos as I can. I'm so excited to talk to you all today. I mean, I cheer you all on. If you come back to Oklahoma, awesome. If not, you know what? Just make it better than you found it. That's kind of, I think we're all, all ended at today, if that's okay. Thanks, y'all.